You're listening to Navigating the French on Paris Underground Radio. For more great content and a bonus episode of Navigating the French, please join us on Patreon. Hello, and welcome to Navigating the French, the podcast where each episode we take a look at a French word and try and see what it tells us about French culture. I'm your host, Emily Monaco. Today, I'm joined by Forrest Collins, the cocktail expert behind 52 Martinis. Today, however, she's joining me not as a cocktail expert, but as a part-time resident of the countryside region of Le Perche to discuss a word that sets Paris off as an urban center, distinct from the 45% of the country still used for agriculture. Provence. And a big welcome back to the podcast to Forrest Collins, who was one of the very first guests on Navigating the French. Thank you so much for coming back, Forrest. Thanks for having me. And Forrest, for those who did listen to the first episode that she joined me on, uh, Apero, will know a little bit about your background here in Paris, but can you clue any newcomers into who you are and what you're doing here in France? Sure. I'm Forrest Collins. Some of you might know me online as 52 Martinis. I have a site that talks about Paris cocktail bars, 52martinis.com. I also have a podcast where I talk about the trends and traditions of drinking in France. I have an iPhone app that helps people find cocktail bars in Paris. I am the Academy Chair for France for the world's 50 best bars. So, you know, I'm pretty, um, I'm pretty involved in the drinking and cocktail culture here, but you know, I also like the food culture, as you know, Emily, because we're both members of the France chapter of Les Dames d'Escoffier. Yes. And you're being very modest because we're not just members. You are our president of the France <laughs> yeah. chapter of Les Dames d'Escoffier. So you wear many, many hats. And uh, I'm excited to have you back on the podcast to chat about something we've discussed before, because I was working on a story for the BBC about a lot of the chefs in Paris who have decided to leave Paris and go to Provence. And that is not Provence, Provence, two different words. So it's directly translated to province, but we kind of use it to mean something a little different than just province in France. It's almost like a counterpoint to Paris. So how do you kind of think of it when people say en province or, you know, the counterpoint being monté à Paris? What's the distinction between province and Paris? I absolutely, first of all, you make a good point with the province and Provence, because when I first learned the word province, of course, I mistook it for the region Provence. I was talking to my very first French friend and he said, well, we're, you know, in Provence. And I was like, no, we're not. That's a different area. <laughs> and he said, no, no, we're outside of Paris. So my entire life here, that's how I very first learned that word is outside of Paris. So I've always taken it to mean anything outside of Paris. When I talk to other French friends, I think they, that that's kind of what they mean as well. And I knew we were going to be talking about this. And so I was just kind of, it was on my mind last night. And it, it, when you just said province, it took me until just last night to think, you know, province, province, why do they always say that? But also it's really tied to, you know, the English word provincial, which I think, so I think that for me, when I hear people say province, they do mean outside of Paris, but also there's sort of these provincial kind of connotations, um, even though there's a lot of things outside of Paris, some of it is more, it's more provincial, some of it's not. So yeah, for me, I definitely think it's a counterpoint to being in Paris. It's being anywhere outside of Paris but that really covers a lot of ground. And for the, you know, this idea of monter à Paris, I do think a large part of it is because Paris is so far north and so many people have to really literally go up to Paris. But I've heard friends in, you know, farther north, like in Lille, say they're going to monter à Paris. So sometimes I, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm not a linguist, but like, I wonder, do you think it's kind of this idea? You know, in the U.S., you might talk about uptown or downtown, and an uptown can have different connotations in different regions, and sometimes it's just a little bit more of a fancier thing. So I wonder if it's kind of this relationship between Monte to go up, and we're going uptown to Paris. Again, I have no, that's just totally a little thought that went through my head, but definitely there's these two, there's these kind of two, it's a, it's a counterpoint, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, that makes total sense to me. And when you think about like one weird fun fact for anybody tuning in today, uh, when you measure distances between French cities, what you're actually measuring is the distance from church to church. 
So if you are on the highway and it says, you know, 100 kilometers to Paris, what they're actually measuring is 100 kilometers to Notre Dame Cathedral. And so that's 0 0.0 of all of the French highways. And it does make me think like, okay, if we're Montaigne, if we're going up to Paris, it's almost like we're going to the beginning because all roads don't lead to Paris. All roads begin in Paris and go out. Hmm. So that was the other reason I was thinking that we might use Monte. But again, I mean, I, I like language, obviously. Otherwise, I wouldn't have a podcast like this, but I'm not a linguist and I haven't studied it in depth. So, but it's definitely a weird sort of quirk of the language. Yeah. And I do. I, I mean, I knew about the point zero in front of Notre Dame. And I think there's even like a little plaque or a little yeah. brass dot or something there. But I never really thought about that in terms of of all of the roads kind of leading back to that. So that makes that makes sense as well. This kind of like going back to the beginning. Oh, learn something new every day. I like that. But if you are here uh, chatting with us about this, and if I reaped some of your knowledge and insight for that story, um, it's because you divide your time a little bit between Paris and elsewhere. Where, if I mean, where no one's asking for your address, but where is your elsewhere? Where do you spend your time when you're not in Paris? My elsewhere is a country house in an area called Le Perche, which is about an hour and a half from Paris, kind of a little west, southwest. So yeah, we live in a somewhat agricultural area. You know, it's, it seems to be getting a little bit more and more of tension, but I spend about half my week in the country house and then the other half in Paris. And do you think, I mean, that sort of phrase country house feels like something that we say a lot in English and particularly in American English. Do the French say maison de campagne or where they say they're going to the campagne or is it more en province? What sort of the phrasing that you hear used most often? Well, I mean, I think it depends on what your situation is. Like I always say I'm going to the country house or sometimes in French, we'll call it maybe a weekend house, even though we're out here more than the weekends now. But if you lived here, you wouldn't be saying that, you know? So I think that when we phrase it like that, either the country house or the weekend house, or now I can't remember, there's something else that we say in French, but it shines a little bit of a light on what you're doing there, right? You know, it means that you're in a position where you can have like a like a, a second home because if you're making that distinction, it's not just home; it's it's my home in the country. But I would never, I would never refer personally. I would never say we're going en, en province. It would always be going to the country country house, and I, I don't really think I hear other people talking about it in that terms either. If they're in the same situation we are, where they have a house elsewhere, I don't know if that answers the question or not. But that's no, I think it thought. does. I think it does. And I think it's probably useful at this point for us to sort of explore the lay of the land a little bit when it comes to what France looks like, because you mentioned that some parts of where you are are fairly agricultural. You alluded as well when you were talking about Provence, that not all of it is as provincial as the rest of it. I think if we think about France being, you know, a fairly developed, modern country, we do still have quite a lot of agricultural land here as compared to a lot of other places and a lot of roads that still take you through villages rather than sort of going around them. When you have France and you have its major metropolises, you know, Paris, Marseille, Nice, Lille and the like, when you leave Paris, you pass through an area that the American news media insists on calling suburbs, which feels not quite right. And then you eventually reach sort of this countryside area. You know, even just if you're imagining when you go out to the country, what sorts of layouts of urban, rural landscape do you end up passing through? How do you sort of imagine France being built in terms of urban, rural, and what's in between? Well, I mean, when we come out here, part of it is, you know, we're just on the auto route, so we're not seeing anything. But once we get off the auto route, then we really are passing through through small living villages. And I can only guess that they were there was roads and then the villages sprung up around the roads because you're not going to, you know, these people were living and working here. So they need to be able to transport their goods and get back and forth. It wasn't sort of a, an escape where they want to like be hidden away in the, in the forest. So yeah, I mean, this is one of the things I love about living in the country is that you see real life and it's, you know, for the most part, it's, it's really quite aesthetically pleasing. It's these old stone villages. It's these really, where where we are, you know, really large fields of wheat because this is a really big wheat producing area or um, big fields of, in this season, rapeseed, which give that really nice big yellow fields and a little bit of sunflowers now. But, you know, you see, you see these people, as I mentioned, agricultural life. So you, you see people who are really 
really farming. And so I think that, yeah, for me, I like, I I really appreciate that. I really appreciate that it it kind of takes you to this real life, but I guess a way of life that maybe we're seeing less and less of now. So I really appreciate still seeing people growing food, even though I recognize that that's a very difficult life. And there's probably a lot of subsidizing that has to go on in France to keep that going, uh, you know, to prevent everything from turning into sort of industrialized farming. But that's what I see. Now, I don't see that everywhere. I mean, there's there's certain pockets where you don't see the charming stone houses. You see more sort of new builds because also people who live out in the country, they're not like me where I, I want this sort of romantic country house getaway that's kind of hard work, but that was kind of part of the deal. It's a project. These are people who live and work there. They don't want to be repairing old stone buildings and trying to make, you know, septic systems work. They just want a new build that's normal so they can get on with life. So so you see little pockets of that as well. And I think that what you're talking about too, this like sort of return of the urban to the rural in the way that you've gone back to the countryside even part-time, or there are some people doing it permanently. France is obviously not alone in this, but I think it's really interesting to examine and explore the ways in which for a while, people from the countryside, the height of success would have been to come up to the cities and specifically to Paris. And so you did see a lot of young people leaving the countryside and you saw the demographics of the French countryside changing where there were not a ton of young people, not a ton of people at the beginning of their careers. And a lot of those intergenerational farming companies, you wouldn't have seen the newest generation wanting to take up the torch of Colza farming or whatever it is that's local to you. And now we are seeing people returning to the countryside, whether it's on a part-time basis like you or on a full-time basis, you know, neo-rurals abandoning their marketing or advertising career in Paris to go out to the countryside and start doing something that's a little bit closer to the land, whether it's, you know, winemaking or, or farming. Do you feel as though the fantasy of that Basically, is the reality of people going out to the countryside, that sounds very romantic, is that the reality? Are people actually returning to the countryside in order to get closer to the land? Is there something else at play? How do you sort of perceive that? I don't know. I mean, I think I see what you're talking about quite a lot. And I think there's a few things at play. I think that, you know, there's a few sort of cultural shifts that make people appreciate it more. So, you know, people are, you know, more as we talk more about eating and drinking local and supporting local and these kind of going back to your agricultural roots kind of movements. And then, so I think there's that that makes it a little bit more, I don't want to say trendy because I mean, I would like to hope that appreciating local is not just a trend and people are really doing it for solid reasons. But, But I think there's that which motivates people. I think that, you know, obviously with COVID, we all learned that we could do a lot more remotely. And so I think people are just tired of that grind and the cost of living in Paris. So when like for example we were looking at moving out here it was right before covid and we were doing a lot of weekend trips out here to look at houses and when we were staying at a few of them we would talk to the you know the owners we were doing airbnbs and in a few of them they would say oh yeah right over here it's kind of this co-working space so it's a lot of a lot of young professionals that are living out here who used to work in paris and now they're all just They want a more relaxed life. They don't want all that city pressure. So, you know, it's this, the ability to move out. It's kind of this, this idea of going local. And so I I think there's those things. And I think, yes, there's obviously the romantic side to it. What I think is, so I see a younger generation coming out here. So for example, there's a goat farm not far from us and we go and we buy goat cheese and it's really great. And it's a pretty young couple really close to us. There's a turkey farm and they've got turkey and geese and what have you. And they came out here and took over from, I think the grandparents that had it. So I'm seeing younger people coming back in to do this kind of thing, but I don't, uh, I, I guess I don't know how to say this either. I think some of it feels a little sort of, they're just kind of writing a zeitgeist of this fun local trend. And I hope they stay with it because it can't be that easy because I also see the mayor of our town who's two doors down and he really does live here and, and all the fields around us are his. And, you know, he's up at crazy hours and he's on his tractor and he's doing, you know, doing everything that you have to do to make a farm work and make a living at it. So I guess it, sometimes it feels like people are coming out and playing and doing some cute little, I'm doing some trendy little cheeses and now we've got some quails, but I hope there's more to it than that. And I hope that this is, has um, legs and kind of a long term viability because I really like to see that happening here. So, but from my impression, the people that I talk to, they feel, especially these two that I'm, that are very close that I visit quite often, they feel very sincere in their desire to be out here and, and be working the land and the animals and what have you. So 
I hope that means we're going to see, for all of these reasons, to be able to escape from the city, to be closer to the land, that we'll see more agricultural growth here of the non-industrial sort, because I think that's what we need to keep it alive. And, you know, that also means supporting people that produce those kind of things. So, you know, we're also very, for us, it's very important when we can to go and, and buy from the producer and buy from the farmer. But that said, yeah, there's a supermarket here and we definitely do a lot of shopping at the supermarket as well. So anyway, that, that was probably a longer answer than you needed. If you're enjoying this episode of Navigating the French, you may also be interested in our sister podcast, Storytime in Paris, where each week host Jennifer interviews a different author about his or her book set in Paris or France. Navigating the French will be right back after a word from our sponsors. And now back to Navigating the French. The fact that so many people did leave the countryside when they did, and the fact that you know, buying local, obviously, given all of the work that you've just described is more expensive. We did see, and I think that a lot of Americans are always stunned to hear this because there's an idea and a, and a desire to preserve the French countryside in our minds as though it really is extremely provincial and hasn't really evolved since, you know, the 1940s. But many of the smaller villages in the French countryside have suffered significantly due to industrialization due to a desire to make things maybe easier and cheaper and therefore to build hypermarkets on the outskirts of the towns. And now you have villages where, you know, not only do you not have a shop or, you know, a butcher, I, I'm thinking of one small village in the French South that I spend a lot of time in, where I think there's 350 full-time inhabitants. And I have a friend there who grew up there and she's 75. And she told me, you know, when she was growing up, there were two hairdressers and three bakeries and two butcher shops and everybody shopped in the town. And so there was enough desire and enough need to, to sort of have all of those businesses. Now there is one shop and we don't have a bakery. And that is actually, a I learned a categorization of village, SB sans boulanger, without a bakery. So A, that shows you how important bread is to the French. But it does also show you that a lot of these villages have kind of suffered as a result of the building of these supermarkets or hypermarkets. So is that something that you've seen in your pocket of France? And is are you seeing any efforts from your local mayor or from individuals to kind of bring the village itself back to life? Well, I, I think, yes, absolutely. You see that affecting the smaller villages. The big supermarkets are packed. They're always packed. It's more affordable. You know, the wages are surely lower out in the countryside. So people are going to absolutely go to the place where it's the most affordable. There's sales. It's open. It's convenient. It's financially easier. For me, we have in our village where we live, there is, we, we are S Bay, but we're very small. We're about 300. And I don't know that there ever was one. But we go to the larger sort of town right next to us, which is you know, maybe 10 kilometers away where they have a market. But it seems to me like I see even over the past four years when I go, now there's less stalls at the market. You know, I don't know if it's just because people are not doing as much shopping in the market and they're you know, doing it at the supermarkets instead. But I've, I've definitely noticed that you don't, we don't have as many options on the one, the one weekly market day. But I do still see really long lines at the two boulangeries that they have in that town. So I do think people still appreciate kind of going in and doing a weekend shop for your bread. Like there's some of these traditions that are nice, but when it comes to doing your full grocery shop, probably not going to happen. In, in terms of food, like I'm, I don't really, I'm not aware of anything that that's going on at a municipal level where they're trying to really encourage people to do that. I mean, there's lots of interest that's trying to encourage people around just the area in general and you know getting more involved in just being attached to it like we have a tiny social club that you can join for our town and so you know we join that and then they take you on walks and they explain things there's a very active tourism board for le perche in general so where they will talk about there's a baguette that's called a percheron i think so you know they kind of like make publicity around this is really special this wheat here is really special you know these kind of things but i don't know of a lot of initiatives that are solely focused on on food but that's probably just because i don't know about them you know it's it's not my i mean i don't i'm not a farmer by trade so i'm probably a little bit out of the loop there but i do think there are initiatives to just have general support and and pride in the area 
Yeah. And I know that, again, like this is anecdotal, but I'm I'm sure that it's happening in other places as well. I know that there are areas where there's been encouragement from the local council or local government to help people open businesses in the town center to sort of bring, this is probably for lo- much larger villages than the ones that you and I are talking about, but for small towns, uh, giving locals uh, who have a desire to open a local business help with loans and things like that to open up in the town center to sort of return foot traffic to the town centers rather than having people constantly getting in their cars and going out to the supermarkets, which are, as you said, always full and less expensive and you know have become kind of the default. And there's some desire to change that, which I think is pretty exciting. Yeah, I've also heard similar things in the Loire. Um, I have friends who've been talking about sort of these government help for exactly that, for opening things like bars and breweries and cafes and things to kind of reinvigorate downtown areas in these small places. So yeah, I support your anecdotal evidence. (laughs) Excellent. Now, another sort of anecdotal question for you, because obviously neither one of us is from France, but we've been living here for a while. We have French friends and you are bouncing back and forth between the countryside and the city. So I'm curious to know if you've encountered any stereotypes relating to those either from or living in the countryside as compared to Parisians. Is there sort of any animosity, whether, you know, uh, tongue in cheek or real between people from Paris and people who are not from Paris? Well, it's hard to say, but in my little area, there's quite a few people that, you know, probably that have, you know, that come out and spend some time for the weekends or whatever. But I think for me, the reactions I get from the locals are because I'm American, not because I'm from Paris. So I'm just different. And and life here is, it does seem to have a certain rhythm and a certain French countryside rhythm. And, you know, we're invited to people's homes for aperitifs and it's, you know, kind of, we always kind of eat the same snacks and, you know, have have a, you know, kind of an aperitif style drink. Yeah. I'm just thinking, yeah, I don't, I mean, I don't really, I'm sure it exists and I, I want to say, Yes, because I feel like in my heart, there probably is. If if you really are a resident here and you've lived here and this is your life, you probably do feel a little bit differently towards Parisians. And also politically leanings are much different here than they are in Paris. So, you know, it's, it's much more, well, much more Le Pen kind of territory. So even for those reasons, I can think they're, they, they must have stereotypes around Parisians, but I haven't experienced it. So maybe if they do, they keep them to themselves and- I, I, and I don't, you know, I don't. Um, but, you know, again, people kind of keep to themselves a bit more here too in certain ways. So, yeah. I mean, I know what kind of ex- stereotypes like we'd all expect, which is why I'm surprised I haven't overtly seen them. I don't know. What do you, what, what would you think? I mean, so my favorite stereotype of Parisians in the countryside is always, and I've heard this story from multiple people in different areas. So it I think at this point it must just be allegory of, you know, a family who comes out to the French countryside from Paris and then goes and complains to the local farmer that his rooster is crowing too early in the morning and they're trying to get some sleep. Yeah. <laughs> and then when, you know, and they complain about it every morning and then finally they cut their vacation short and they leave a couple of days early and the next morning the farmer celebrates with coco vin. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah, I like that story. <laughs> yeah. But but I feel like, you know, we're here for that, right? And so I think that kind of al- along those lines, I do think sometimes our neighbors kind of kind of laugh a little bit at us because we're out here, we're going to make a garden, we're over there borrowing their little tiller. And, you know, we've made a total mess of it. We're not, we haven't been very successful yet. So, you know, I think they kind of laugh down their noses a little bit at the city folk coming out and trying to be farmers, but I don't mind. I, you know, yeah. I, I I get it. Like they work hard at it and I'm just kind of playing around in my backyard, just trying to learn how this stuff works more. So I'm, I'm okay with a little, a little laughter at my expense for those kind of things. Yeah. And I've had, I mean, I don't have a country house and I have, I do not have a green thumb. I kill anything, but I will say that when I've gone out into the countryside and met with farmers for my journalism job and sort of, you know, I turn up and I'm this like city girl in my city clothes and, you know, I show up on their farm and they're like, okay, who the hell is this? And then I start actually asking like pretty technical questions about cheese making or like cow breeds. And they're like, oh, okay. Well, in that case, come in the barn. You just showed your cred. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. But then I also feel like the the inverse is true when you have people who've left the countryside and go to the cities. There's sort of this 
I wouldn't say that Parisians are judgmental of the country folk. I would almost say that the country folk band together once they've arrived in Paris to sort of be like, we're here because we have to be. But these silly Parisians with their silly, you know, shabby chic decor of their Parisian bars, like this looks like something my grandmother has in her house. So I think that they do think, I think that a lot of the time people from the Provence think that Parisians are a little bit silly in our desire to have something rural in our lives, whether we're actually going out to the countryside or just, you know, making cafes and brasseries that feel a little bit like your grandmother's front room. Yeah, I I, I totally agree with that. It's the equivalent of me kind of playing around in the the, <laughs> the yard yeah. far, with, at my farming. Yeah. Or exactly these kind of, just as you said it, shabby chic kind of places that are meant to look like French farmhouses, but you know, they're really in Paris and you know, yeah. Yeah. And I did want to bring up just, and I know that you're not a fan of this particular program, but I feel like I have to tell our uh, listeners at home that we do have a reality TV program in France called L'Amour est dans le Pré, which means love is in the fields. And basically it's they they find a farmer in the middle of nowhere who is looking for love and they sponsor three people. It's usually male farmers and women from the city, although they've played with the model a couple of times. And it's basically about pitting some city girl against the country mentality of a farmer bachelor. And I've had friends from the countryside get upset about the way that farmers are portrayed as being super backwards on that show. But I do think that the very existence of the show kind of shows us that that divide between what Parisians expect the countryside to be and what people from the countryside actually feel their lived experience to be. There's kind of this portrayal of it as a place that's a little backwards. And I don't think that that's necessarily always the case. Is that your experience? Yeah, that's my experience. Now, as you know, I've never seen that show, but I'm very, very aware of it because people love that show. And I think I've probably seen a couple of ads on television for it because that's exactly what I thought. I thought, wow, these be like in my mind, what I think I've seen is these really hokey farmers, right? You know, bad teeth or weird hair, just not really, really to the extreme, which you're going to find on reality TV, right? They're, they're going to find the most extreme cases that they can. But ex- absolutely. I mean, the fact that people love watching that so much, the fact that it's, it's produced at all. I mean, and it's not just France, right? I mean, I think everywhere you've got sort of the image of the city folk and the country folk. So yeah. And I think that just really kind of amplifies maybe subtle differences, but amplifies it the way that people kind of imagine it. But, you know, it's not really the case. Like I, most of the people that I meet here that live here in the countryside that are full-time countryside residents that have lived here all their lives, they're pretty just, you know, regular people like we are not in this, you know, extreme kind of hillbilly kind of sense that I think they're, they're portrayed in maybe in La Moraille dans le Pré. If you're enjoying this episode of Navigating the French, you may also be interested in our sister podcast, The Heart of You, where expert Annette talks manifesting, tarot, and so much more. Navigating the French will be right back after a word from our sponsors. And now, back to Navigating the French. It's just, I think, the media's ability to make us believe things about the places where we aren't. And I think to to respond also to your sort of very fair judgment of the political leanings being a little bit different in the countryside. On the flip side of L'Amour et dans le Pré, you also have shows not dissimilar to cops in the US on French TV, where it shows, you know, the the police busting into crazy parties happening in Paris. And a lot of the time, pretty xenophobic or racist kind of portrayals of what's actually happening in the cities that makes people in the countryside feel as though the cities are somehow hotbeds for for crime and and all sorts of, yeah. of issues. I mean, it's it's really media portrayal of these two parts of France being extremely different from each other. And I think yeah. different from the reality, especially I'm sure you having spent time in both can can speak to that, you know, those things being pretty inflamed. <laughs> It's the media's job, right? Like they want to find that conflict and really highlight it and really amp it up and potentially create a little fear, you know, Mm -hmm. in in either direction, because that's what's more exciting than just, you know, life is okay here. Life is okay there. People are generally pretty nice. And, you know, (laughs) I mean, 
It's, it's that's nobody writes an article about people are pretty decent, <laughs> which is kind of like nice. <laughs> my experience, right? Yeah. Yeah. So you're in an area, uh, Le Perche, as you said, that is kind of becoming a pretty popular place for Parisians to go. It's not too far from Paris. I think especially what you were mentioning during confinement, people were sort of looking for a place where they could go for a bit more air. We've seen a lot of chefs coming out to the Perche. We've seen a lot of Parisians either moving full-time or part-time out to the Perche. What's your perception been in the time that you've been going out there of any sort of evolution in terms of whether it's you know, housing prices, availability of certain commodities that you would find in Paris? Are you seeing sort of Le Perche evolving because there are more Parisians? Yeah, I can't speak to housing prices because we haven't really looked at housing prices since we got this, you know, four years ago. But but you definitely see this Parisian seep of things that you can get in Paris here now. I mean, we probably talked about this before, but since we've lived here, you know, Septime, the Parisian restaurant Septime has opened up a small restaurant here um, with an attached hotel kind of, or boutique hotel, I don't know, hotel, jeet, I don't know what it is. And so you're starting to see a lot more things like this. I was just this weekend at a at a restaurant in Le Perche, and I thought I could just, this restaurant could be in Paris. It's like a, it's a natural wine heavy list. They've got orange wines on here. They're using real kind of trendy, like Thierry, Puzla um, wines. And I thought, oh, this is, is very kind of a hipster Parisian dining thing, but it's excellent. It was really good, you know, also Parisian prices. So it was full, but I thought, okay, I'm kind of out in the middle of nowhere, but I'm still paying what I would be paying in Paris. And then I just saw someone on Instagram this weekend who is a journalist saying who was eating there and, and kind of had a little hashtag on assignment. So I'm assuming that we'll be hearing more about this restaurant, Wazo Wazo, which is where I was. So I'm seeing more of these little, uh, what I'm not really used to in the countryside. And I'm not saying that you don't get good product in the countryside, but I'm not used to such a, like a trendy options for drinking. So all of the natural wines and also cocktails on this list, a small but solid list of cocktails. It's just not what I expect to see. You know, I expect to go out to the countryside and get, you know, really good fare, but not quite so modern French fussy. And so I'm just seeing more places like this open up. There's another kind of wine bar, small plates place that I go to in another town. And, and it's, it's very, again, you know, heavy on natural wines and, um, you know, and you kind of have to, uh, just like you did with the farmers, I kind of had to go and improve my my drinking credentials before they were friendly with me and like, ah, come over here and try this other bottle of wine now. I'm seeing more little boutique hotels pop up. So it, it's becoming, you know, I, I've been hearing rumblings for the past three or four or five years that Le Péache really is going to be the next sort of little like trendy bobo kind of region. And I'm seeing it happen. And I think that can only be driving up prices. And so, I mean, I'm excited about it, but I'm also kind of, you know, not excited about it because I, I I want normal life to continue. I don't want people to feel where the life they lived is no longer accessible to them because, you know, all of these like trendy new hot little spots are coming in. But, you know, hopefully that's an unfounded fear on my part. I think that oftentimes when things change, we're scared, right? So we're like, oh God, this can't be good. This can't be good. But, you know, maybe it bodes well for the whole region. I'd like to hope so. No, that seems really fair. Now we've done quite a quite a journey through French countryside and Provence. And before I let you go, I just wanted to ask you if there was any other piece of this sort of imagined fantasy that many Americans have of the French countryside that you think we haven't really addressed in its entirety in our in our conversation today. Uh, no, and I, I think <laughs> that people are fully aware of this, but you know, it's not it's not like we imagine, you know, we're still four years later and our fixer up are still fixing it up. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of challenges. It's really hard to get, find people to come out and do construction work. So, you know, it's, it, I love it. I love being out here and I've, but I've had to really learn to be a lot more patient and a lot less um, like kind of goal oriented and more process oriented, more just enjoy trying to make the garden work. And if it doesn't work this year, well, it wasn't a great season for tomatoes and enjoy planting them again tomorrow instead of just focusing on only enjoying the tomatoes, you know, and just kind of everything. It's, it's the yard will get done. The construction will get done. So, you know, we all have this like beautiful fantasy of moving out to this kind of French barn countryside but there's a lot of kind of logistics and work and patience that go behind it, which I think people are aware of, but sometimes forget when they're, you know, wearing the rose tinted glasses. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I love that. And it reminds me definitely anyone who's read Peter Mayo's book will know what that feels like. Oh, God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, A year in Provence this time, not Provence, Provence. But I mean, even even in the city, uh, actually, yes, it was when I was in Cannes, which is a city, but it's also in the Provence because it's not Paris. I remember standing in line at the, at the post office. And then finally they decided it was lunchtime. And even though I was already in line, they were like, all right, you'll have to come back after lunch. And I was like, you can't have a to-do list in France. You have to have a to attempt list. Uh, Yes, exactly. And it feels like that's even more true in the countryside. (laughs) Exactly. Yes. Just recently I went to a bar cafe for a kind of a business type of meeting and I got there and they said, oh, no, we'll open in an hour. And I said, but, you know, you're supposed to open actually 10 minutes ago. Yeah, but, we, you know, same thing. We we're kind of open earlier this morning. We opened longer. So now we're opening later. And yeah, and take that to the country and you're multiplying it even more. You know, it's just kind of, it's it's suggested opening hours kind of, yeah. But yeah. not, not uh, always strictly maintained. Mm-hmm. But it definitely encourages, you know, a a laissez-faire sort of attitude, which is another good French word. So I'm not I'm not opposed to it. Well, thank you so much for joining me again on the podcast, Forrest, and enjoy your beautiful countryside. And hopefully we'll hear from you again on Navigating the French. Well, thank you very much for having me. And I'd love to come back and navigate some more topics in the future. So hopefully we will. Awesome. This has been Navigating the French. You can find more from me, Emily Monaco, at Emily underscore in underscore France on Twitter and Instagram. This podcast is produced by Paris Underground Radio. To listen to other episodes of this podcast or to discover more podcasts like it, please visit parisundergroundradio.com. Thanks for listening and à bientôt. This episode of Navigating the French was produced by Jennifer Garrity for Paris Underground Radio. For more great content, join us on Patreon at patreon.com slash Paris Underground Radio.